I think it's called cornhole. Cornhole. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's like a bean bag. That's it's just, like, just like a hasty sack. They're just watching. I'm like, hey, what do you guys? Shh, Rufus. <laughs> Be quiet. I'm like, it's like golf. You don't, you don't like, it's like golf. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to You Matter Here, our Minnesota Transitions Charter School podcast where we elevate the voices of our people, dig deeper into our big ideas, and explore how we show up for ourselves and each other in order to make magic happen. I am your host, Wendy Lorenz Walraven, the Director of Equity and Diversity here at MTCS. My hope is that as we spend time together, we will have an opportunity to explore three key questions. Who am I? Who are we? And who are we to each other? as it is the intersection of these questions that informs the assumptions we make, drives our behavior, and impacts our relationships with ourselves and with others. So today I'd like to introduce our guest, Rufus Brown, our licensed alcohol and drug counselor at Pease Academy. Welcome, Rufus. Thank you so much for joining us today for our MTCS podcast, You Matter Here. I look forward to learning more about you, about your connection to Pease and your insights on navigating recovery alongside your education. So let's get curious. Rufus, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and how you joined our MTCS community? Absolutely. I'm a licensed and alcohol drug counselor. I started working in the recovery field at Fairview University of Minnesota Riverside on a locked adolescent treatment facility in the early 90s. So I've worked in the field for quite a long time uh, with adolescents, with adults, inpatient, outpatient, residential, extended care, and even corrections. And I was approached maybe 11 years ago by who was now the Pease Academy director, Michael Derschlag, and we had some conversations about me joining the team there at Pease Academy, which led to an interview and eventually led to my hire. That was back in 2013. That's amazing. So when you talk a little bit about the various settings that you have been in um, and really served um, you know, people all over the spectrum of age, what has been um, something that has been either sort of surprising or really different for you being so clinically minded in an educational setting specifically? Um, in terms of work history and experience, one of the things that became very clear was the difference between working with adolescent clients and adult clients was only their age. Mm -hmm. And that 43 year olds often act like they're 15. Mm -hmm. Specifically for Pease Academy, uh, it was challenging initially because I come from a field of treatment uh, treatment is under the umbrella of the Department of Human Services. There's lots of rigmarole, <laughs> lots of policies, lots of procedures. There's a school of thought in terms of accountability and approach mm -hmm. that is very different in an educational setting. So I found and still can find challenging sometimes how do I do clinical work in a non-clinical setting? Right, which is definitely trying to find that balance mm -hmm. um, is is tricky for sure. I have had the privilege of watching you work directly with young people, um, which is something I am very grateful for. Um, would you be willing to share a little bit with our listeners about the unique opportunities that uh, young people have at Pease because they have direct access to you specifically throughout their school day? Absolutely. So Pease Academy as a whole, when we have a young person with substance abuse disorder, um, their substance abuse and chemical use are out of control, they're causing harm to them in any one of life's major areas, and they go away to treatment. If they try to go back to their main school where they were, where their reputation is firmly established, all their connections, all their friends are using and try to be clean and sober all by themselves, that is very daunting. Mm -hmm. 
And so they can come to Pease Academy, continue to move forward with their high school education in an atmosphere that understands and supports recovery, where all the other students also have similar histories and are trying to be clean and sober themselves. Specifically for me in my role, um, I have an open door. So the students will just come down in the middle of science class or they'll Google chat me, hey, I need to talk and I'll Google chat back, come on down and they'll come down. Oftentimes it's about them. As we move through the holiday seasons, I saw many more visits as the holidays can be a challenging time for people in recovery. All those old Hollywood movies, the whole family around the table, the large white linen tablecloth, that is not the reality that a lot of our students have had. So family of origin based issues got stirred up. Mm. Or the people who they wished were still here that aren't here, grief and loss, got stirred up. Right. And holidays can also be used by many people as an excuse to go ahead and woo <laughs> and live it up. And how do I deal with my focus and my goal to remain clean and sober when everyone around me is finding every excuse possible to have one more beer, one more glass, or one more whatever? Right. So a lot of those visits came. Using dreams, cravings, urges. So the students, they just come down as needed to talk about talk about whatever's going on with them, struggles or successes. Sometimes I have um, a request. We do random urinalysis tests and I'll have four or five kids on the UA list and I'll go around, I want a UA today. I like to have it before lunch. Please don't be avoidant, come on down when you're ready to go. And then we um, get the UA list we check the people off as they come down and do their UAs. Sometimes that's the moment they go, um, <laughs> Rufus, I have something to uh, tell you. Yep. And I'm going to go, really, what is that? <laughs> and so we really want what we call spiritual principles or new skills. So invested and so veteran at covering up, lying, being deceitful and deceptive mm -hmm. can be some of our students they're afraid, you know, maybe they used a week ago and they wanted to tell, but they were scared of the possible outcome. Right. Now that the UA is here, they want to be forthcoming. And so I try to just create an atmosphere where it was safe and comfortable for them to tell the truth, give them some gentle encouragement, unburden yourself. We call that clearing away spiritual clutter. Mm -hmm. I also have regularly scheduled groups PST, which stands for Peer Support Team, and SSG, which stands for Sobriety Support Group. And my groups have various topics. A lot of it is process group. But I might have, like, tell me two good deeds that you've done in the past week. What's a good goal for the week coming up? And just kind of pass that um, as topics around. I might have forgiveness versus resentment and just introduce that as a topic and have them sound off as they need, sometimes students get assignments and we'll give them a few days or maybe even a week. They'll come down and they'll say, okay, I'm ready. Here's 10 reasons why I deserve to be clean and sober. Here's 10 burdens or things that I carry around that I need to get rid of and we'll just have dialogue. Sometimes they'll wanna bring a peer, whoever they think their best friend is at school to be of support and that person will sit in with us but they can come down anytime throughout the day. Yeah, and those are normalized conversations that you have and expectations that you have to process those elements of, um, of a young person's lives alongside of, you know, holding the importance of math and, <laughs> and credits because, you know, all of our young people are really trying to genuinely graduate from, from high school. So I think that, again, is one of the things that I'm continuously amazed at at, at Pease is being able to hold the balance of the importance of both of those things, right, and being able to help young people in high school, which is a hard enough time for <laughs> young people anyways. And then you add the layers of experience of, of use and recovery into, into that process and um, your ability to create spaces for people to tap into their honesty 
in a way that is safe, I think is a new experience for many of our young people, right? Especially when you have use in the, in the mix of the relationships that you have with people in your life, there's often a lack of safety to own <laughs> your behavior or your truth, right? Which can lead to all kinds of um, sort of additional choices thereafter. Um, so your ability, I think very specifically, but the entire peace community to be able to create a space that we say, we own our stuff here. <laughs> this is this is where we have to start to do that so that we can start paving a different path because the road we know super well is the one where we are not truthful to ourselves or others. Intrinsic in the work that I do in order to get to those deeper levels, like there has to be a solid, solid bond Mm -hmm. Trust level has to be very high. And sometimes we just uh, shoot the breeze um, about shows. Oh, and they got to tell me about this show, Ozarks, mm -hmm. on Netflix. And I'm like, really? Oh, Rufus is so incredible. <laughs> and so we talk about TV shows and movies. And uh, at one point, uh, we had a sixth hour cosmetology class. And I learned a lot about fingernails. And I always thought <laughs> fake nails, you just go to Walgreens, pay nine ninety nine, <laughs> buy a pack and stick them on. What's the big oh, deal? Oh, no. And yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I got a tutorial. <laughs> so you, there's a special place you go. You have to have an appointment. You just sit in a waiting room, like like a doctor's office. <laughs> and then there, yeah, it's a planned oh, scheduled yes. event. There are acrylic <laughs> fingernails mm, mm -hmm. and gels, and they are not the same. Not the same at all. And they don't cost nine ninety nine. Nope. It's Seventy bucks. <laughs> I lean forward. I'm like seventy dollars. Yeah, they're good for a whole two weeks. Yeah. Then you're, why are you picking at them? Don't you want to protect? You should have mittens on. <laughs> like newborns. <laughs> Just keep them safe. That's an investment. And so we have uh, lighter conversations. Mm -hmm. That, that leads to connections and a sense of safety and rapport. Mm -hmm. And that makes it easier then for them to come down and talk to me about stuff that, well, he's an adult. And many adolescents just view all adults as some form of an authority figure. Right. Oh, but he's cool. He's, he knows about fingernails. <laughs> he knows about Ozarks. Mm -hmm. My friend Sarah said that he, you could talk to him about anything. Maybe I'll try. And then once we get past that first hurdle, whew, mm -hmm. now they know that they can come down and talk to me a second time or a third time, or if they have a using dream. Mm -hmm. Or I had a kid once who caught the bus, caught two buses to come to Pease Academy, and they were in the back of the bus, and their old dealer got on the bus. Mm -hmm. And the dealer was near the front and didn't see them, but they shrank in their seat and kind of tried to hide. And they just came in very shaky, just seeing the person trauma trigger right brought back all of the stuff that they've been working so hard to stay away from they were shaky and nervous and we took some time to de-escalate kind of calm them down i'm glad you didn't see him but i also like reality-based therapy right if that's a bus route that you take and he takes might see him again let's plan now for what we'll do if he ever sees us and makes eye contact and mm -hmm. says hey there you are i've been wondering what happened to you how will we respond? Yeah, because those are real, mm -hmm. right? Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And again, I think to being a part of the peace community, you have an opportunity to intentionally craft your school environment, right? To be one of, of support and, and, and people who really understand kind of on a deeper level what you're going through. Um, but the peace community doesn't follow you <laughs> around your your real life, right? And and the realities of again, you know, living in, and being in the same areas in which you have some time in history, um, you're bound to run into some people. And so, being able to work through that aspect with young people, not only in real time, right? Like as soon as they got off the bus and mm -hmm. came into school, but to be able to know, like, okay, we need to have a plan for this, and this is one more way that you'll be prepared out in the world. Um, which again, I think is really critical for, for young people, especially young people who are so used to living in such an impulsive kind of, um, you know, state to be able to be like, oh, okay, this situation I did actually plan for. <laughs> let me, let me pull out what Rufus and I came mm -hmm. up with. Right. Mm -hmm. And then practice. I, I let them know that we're learning how to live a new life. Mm-hmm. And that these skills we're not used to it is very easy to go back to what is most familiar. Right. 
and that it takes time and it takes practice, just like playing the piano. Yeah, it sure does. What are some of the biggest insights uh, that you have learned from the young people that you serve? Hmm. That, uh, that example of the burdened, when I think of substance abuse or excessive use, I think of it in the context of escape. Mm -hmm. When what the person really wants to do is to be numb, not feel anything, not think anything, and just escape. So I shift my focus to what is it that you're trying to escape from? Mm -hmm. And many people um, observing from afar might think, oh, that young person is just experimenting. It's just a phase. Um, one of the biggest insights is when we're in my office and we start to kind of comb through the tangled hair to take a look at what is underneath. And there's a lot. So despite their age, you might expect someone who's 38 or 42 to have been through it uh, quite a bit, to have quite a bit of what we, <laughs> we call them kettlebells in their emotional backpack. Mm. But you can have just as many and only be 16 years old. Totally. So when, let's say hypothetically, a young lady whose name might be Molly comes in, sits down for a minute, and is just silent, I don't say anything, because I don't want to steer direct, I will let them decide what we're going to talk about and where it goes. Unzips her zipper jacket and shows me the fresh cut marks on her arm. And she said, well, I had a relapse, but I didn't use chemicals. I had a relapse in behavior, and I cut last night. And we just addressed that. But also on her arm, I see the whole history of self-harm, mm -hmm. all the other cuts. So the biggest insight is probably, you know, they put on their happy, smiley face uh, at home or in the community. They're supposed to do their chores, have a little part-time job, maybe take driver's ed. Um, but inside, they're hurting. They're in so much pain. And that one of the things we provide at Peace Academy is a safe and comfortable environment where they can unzip that backpack show me what's inside or reach inside themselves when they have enough courage and pull out one of their kettlebells. Like, I've been carrying this one around since I was 12. Mm -hmm. And then just start bawling. I have lots of tissue boxes yeah. in, in my office. So maybe one of the biggest insights um, is they're shouldering the emotional um, payload of issues complex emotions that adults have without the maturity, the frontal lobe development to handle it. Mm -hmm. And so thus use, or sometimes in the absence of using, will harm themselves. Right. Yeah. The relationships that you were talking about, I think one of the things that stands out so much to me there is that you always have opportunities to build relationships, whether you're really aware of it or not, right? And that it could be this really benign, very simple interaction that you have with a young person that literally can be the thing that opens up a door to being able to have a deeper level conversation with you about things that really do matter, right? But that we have to test the waters first with all these things that are sort of low risk, low stakes um, to be able to see who the people are that will hold space for us when we disclose something deeper. That's a good description, who the people are, because I'm not everyone's chosen ear mm -hmm. to listen to things within Peace Academy and on our team. Um, PST stands for Peer Support Team, and it represents kind of what is our home group. So our English teacher, her name is Sarah. Someone who's in Sarah's PST may feel more comfortable and be more inclined to go to Sarah and talk about things or whatever it is that's going on. And then Sarah will let me know, hey, so-and-so's dealing with this, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Or once they have a conversation, then I'll get a Google chat from Sarah or a phone call like, hey, you know, I was just talking to Pete, and Pete could really use some support. Is it okay if I send him down? I'm like, yeah, okay, come on down. Right. And so the clinical work in a non-clinical setting Maybe something that's different about Peace Academy than just general schools across the state is our staff uh, has a finely tuned radar 
they, they, we all have antenna for the subtleties of uh, emotionality. You know, it could just be walking. A student comes in different. Their body language is a little different. They sit down, <sighs> the deep sigh. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that does the deep, deep down work, but all of our staff uh, have a, a finely tuned sense of what might be going on in a, in a how do I help them kind of way, but we, you know, we're looking at what we call the disease of addiction, which is necessary, not necessarily just about substance abuse, because there are other things. Right. <laughs> so when I try to describe um, to parents uh, what to look for, substance use is just one symptom of what we call the disease of addiction. Mm -hmm. And so I like a lot of detective shows, so I use analogies, I talk about fingerprints, and when they go in and they're looking for DNA evidence and got evidence bags, they're also dusting for fingerprints. Well, the fingerprints, certainly for adolescents, for the presence of the disease is breaking rules, manipulating, lying, keeping secrets, and being sneaky. So not just me, but the rest of the staff at Pease Academy, we have our antenna up for sneaky behavior. As small a thing as trying to sneak and vape in the bathroom in between classes, which is against the rule, because if I start to do it a little bit in one area of my life, I'll do it a lot in all the other areas of my life. And maybe they're still not using chemicals, but they're fully engaged in sneaky behavior. It could be sneaking out at night, breaking curfew, they get a little more defiant, refuse to come to school, and they're kind of stepping down that path that leads to the return of substance use. So we're pretty sharp. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, again, too, that really highlights how well you get to know your students, right? Like part of your ability to be that well attuned is again how much you're paying attention to the young people who are in front of you so that you can pick up on those subtleties because you only notice them when you have relationships in the ways that you do. So when you are thinking about again sort of the parents or young people who might be listening to us now who um either haven't quite gotten there but or might be really at the sort of precipice of um, to recognize like this is more than experimentation this is more than um, than one might be considered to be um, developmentally appropriate or normal um, but when it really starts to take in and you had mentioned earlier um, when things start to really impact multiple areas of your life whether that's your your home life and your relationships whether that's school whether um, that's again your, your social um, environment and network and when things start to become really dysfunctional in those places and spaces um, you know that, that we have people who might be looking around for like what now right what's next sort of that's sort of step one of going do we have a problem here and what might we do about it? When you think about those, those folks, so those, those parents or guardians, you know, people um, in young people's lives and that, and that young person, what might you say to those people? Well, if they're interested in how to support their son or daughter, maybe this is the second part. If they're interested in how to support their son or their daughter in efforts to stop using but move forward in their education. Certainly they can come, they can call the main number at Pease Academy. It's easily located. Um, we're in Southeast Minneapolis. You can have a conversation with my boss, Michael Dershlog, schedule an informal information session where you can come in and ask a whole bunch of questions. He can provide a lot of information, maybe on the front end, you wanna seek uh, what's called a chemical health assessment where a trained professional takes a look at type, amount, frequency, and then ancillary, like how many different areas of your life are being impacted by your chemical use, and is it being impacted to the degree that it raises alarm? Yeah. Sometimes it's so clear and evident, like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you need help immediately. <laughs> and sometimes it can be a little more subtle always within the um, high school age range uh, school school's a good indicator 
where once there was an A's and B student in their freshman year, between sophomore and heading in, now getting into their junior year, those are dropped to D's. Attendance has fallen off dramatically. They're skipping a lot, shift in friend group, have an attitude or mouthiness or something negative to say. They kind of have uh, unplugged or given up, and they will tell you very loud, <laughs> very loud, and clearly, I don't give a boop. <laughs> yep. And so if there is some substance abuse, it could be showing up in that way, and you could just, you know, take them in to get a chemical health assessment, and there are plenty of uh, facilities around that can do a uh, chemical health assessment on an adolescent. Fairview certainly could, like any of the substance abuse, Hazleton Substance Abuse Treatment Centers can kind of take a look and see, is it time to just tighten up, okay, stop hanging around those friends, maybe you need some more positive activities, let's join band and get you into volunteering on Saturday afternoons, and maybe that's enough. Maybe they need to take a look at uh, outpatient treatment, or maybe they need to go to some what we call community-based recovery supports. And those are like AA meetings or NA meetings or other type of support, because there's all kinds, of, there's even the, the Zen meditative recovery supports. Awesome. So at Pease Academy, I don't just work with our students, I also work with their parents. So the first Thursday of every month, we have what we call the Parents of Peas meeting. And parents are all welcome uh, to come and bring their concerns and bring their questions. And it's, it's less therapeutic and more just a uh, process. I just facilitate the group. And parents, uh, newer students, parents always come uh, with lots of energy and lots of concerns questions. These meetings that they go to start so late. Should, should they be going during the, <laughs> right. during yeah. the week? Could they just go on the weekends? They're breaking the curfew again. They're not doing their chores again. Mm -hmm. All they do is come home and go straight to their room. Well, the parents, parents share their concerns and they put them out there in the floor and then I'll have more of a veteran set of parents say, oh, we had that problem. Here's what we did. Here's where, here's where we went. And I, I support the parents. I give them feedback, give them information, give them some parent coaching. I let them know about Al-Anon. Al-Anon historically was for the spousal person of an alcoholic. AA is for the person that loves vodka. Al-Anon is for the person that loves the person that loves vodka. But because of the times that we live in now, there are some Al-Anon meetings that are specifically parent-child in their design. Mm. And so they can meet with the parents of other youth uh, who are moving into recovery, either successfully, begrudgingly kicking and screaming, or kind of struggling a little bit. So they can have somewhere where they can go within the community for support. Yeah, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is, again, just all of the opportunities that you provide for the young people to find community, to build a new kind of community, right? I think one of the things that comes up for me, too, is is how much sort of identity work has to occur at this time for for a young person, right? And trying to really carve out sort of this, this sense of who am I, especially when some of how I might have identified is is a part of um, of behavior or, or you know or, or practice that isn't helpful and can be potentially harmful for people. Um, so being able to find and create your own community that you can explore and create a different identity, but you also are doing that and allowing those same spaces for parents, um, which again I think is is a unique um, offering that we have within the Puse community. So so for the client, for the student, um, the brass tax of that is, is grief and loss issue. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, um, not just with adolescent clients, but even with adult clients, we reconcile or come to grips with um, having to let go of my street name mm -hmm. 
whatever I want to buy, and everybody's got one. Yep. Some people have two. <laughs> Letting go of that image, that identity, those people, those places. And um, I'm often challenged them, well, if you don't hang out with them and go to those places, where will you go? Right. Who will you hang out with? Mm-hmm. And so moving forward, it can be uncomfortable, a little daunting to create new social connections, healthy ones. People who are on the same path that you are on. Yeah, which I think is probably part of the process, regardless of when you find your way into recovery, right? As a, as a young person mm-hmm. um, or at any point in your life that there is that that grief and loss process, that redefining, that finding a new community, that a new network of people that you can surround yourself um, with. So I imagine that it's, it's fairly daunting at whatever point you come to, um, to this path. But I can imagine particularly for young people who are taking in so much information about who they are socially and how they connect with their, with their peers, um, that being able to, to come to a place like Pease, uh, I think can really genuinely make the difference for people. Mm-hmm. My image, my reputation. Right. I'm popular in this group. And, and you're asking me to give all of that up mm-hmm. and then try to help them learn how and what to replace that with. Right. And the previous comment, the, the part that pertains to parents, a little different from other high schools at Pease Academy, when we have our graduation, like most people there are, are, are just bawling. They're just in tears. Mm-hmm. So across high schools all over the state, parents, you know, have their fingers crossed. I hope my kid's going to graduate. hope they don't drop out. I want them to graduate. Maybe they'll go to college or not, but at least get your high school diploma. And the thing about the Pease Academy parents is there was a point in time they didn't even think their son or daughter was going to live. Right. And so to see them you know, not just be alive, but to be stable, be moving forward in their recovery, getting all their credits in the curriculum stuff, school-based stuff, so they can graduate. And then to make it to that point is really, it's like a double celebration. Right. Like parents don't just come, they bring aunts, they bring grandparents, (laughs) some nieces and a few nephews. Mm -hmm. Everybody's clapping and crying. What is a a point of of hope or joy when you think about the people who are listening that 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 version of of life being on the sort of the other side of it feels so far away what is a sort of point of of hope or a a common experience that you've heard parents share um who who have gotten to a different point with their young person who is alive and well and thriving I've had lots of parents through the years come, you know, always thankful. Mm-hmm. You know, we have large fundraisers, the Peace Academy breakfast where former students will come back. Um, parents of former students will come back. Some of them are on our board. I just call them the mom squad. <laughs> and they all, they say, oh, I just want to thank you again. You know, we're just so proud of them. They're doing so well now. They have two, three, four, five years in recovery or more. You know, we were really touch and go there for a while, but you guys, you knew what to do, and we're so grateful for you. There's, there's, there, more often than not, there's a bottoming out. There, there's something significant. There was a, there's a young man who, the last I heard, he was still in Europe. <laughs> he went to Dakota County uh, Community or Technical College uh, for electrical engineering. Somehow applied himself for student exchange thing and he came and he told us I'm going to Europe we're like what (laughs) and the last I heard he was still somewhere in Europe Amazing. but there was a point where continued use so dirty UAs trying to get him to be honest clear away what we call spiritual clutter just be honest tell the truth unburden yourself dug both heels in folded his arms no (laughs) fought with us mom is there me my boss is there refused and so we sent him to treatment and he went to treatment kicking and screaming but then after treatment he came back stayed clean and sober was a model student went on to college 
and now has a passport and is somewhere in Europe, I'm not quite sure, but I'm sure he's taking lots of pictures and having the time of his life. Yeah. So there's usually some kind of argument, some big fight or some big event, like that's a tipping point. Mm. And then things get better from there. Or, sadly but truthfully, when we make a decision that this student needs to get a chemical health assessment, follow through with all the recommendations, the kid will refuse, the family will relent. Like, well, if you're not going to follow through with the recommendation, this clearly is not the school for you, and they go. We don't see them, and we don't hear from them again. Or we don't see or hear from them for quite a while, and then, boop, they'll pop back up. You know what, you were right. <laughs> Things got much worse. We're ready to try now, there's some willingness. So I don't know if there's a particular point of hope for each student. Some of them met that point before they came to Pease. Mm -hmm. They will often learn about Pease Academy in an adolescent treatment facility during the family education portion. If going back to your traditional high school where most of the people use sounds too risky, we know about this school called Pease Academy. Maybe you wanna go visit them, take a tour, hear what information they have to provide, ask any questions you have, that might be a better fit. And then they come to us and just move forward from there. Yeah. I think the point of hope that I hear is that there are communities, there are resources, and there is a place and many people who will continue to show up for you and your young person again and again and again in ways that allow for growth, for um, messing up, for missteps, uh, and in a way that will allow for, again, some of that healing um, to, in order to, to be able to start paving a different pathway for yourself, that we are a place that you can come and be sort of wrapped around in that support and in that community to be able to genuinely create a different life for yourself. Yes, I'd say that's accurate. Excellent. More than just within Pease Academy, outside of Pease Academy. Most people are familiar with um, community recovery supports like AA. Mm -hmm. There is a particular youth branch on the AA tree they call Mini Paw. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember exactly what it said from Minnesota Young People's AA. And they're a high energy, vaping monster, Red Bull drinking, <laughs> you know, under 30 group. Mm -hmm. And so some of our students have graduated and moved on, and now they're a part of the younger part of AA. So they go to meetings, they have outings, they have fun stuff to do, they have these conventions. And so one of the big fears for an adolescent is, I'm gonna be so bored. Right. I won't have no friends. Mm -hmm. Or they'll all wear glasses like me and have <laughs> protractors, like <laughs> calculators in their back pocket. <laughs> Is that a cell phone or a calculator? <laughs> They're just delighted to find out um, that there's this whole section of the population that is thriving, living clean and sober, not just within uh, the high school, like at Pease Academy, within our age, age range, but they move on into college mm -hmm. and continue to stay recovered. They move on into the professional field, you know, whatever their chosen occupation is. But they get, to be, they get together to celebrate recovery and that they hacky sack and now the big thing is this beanbag toss at like a slightly inclined plank with a hole in it. I don't know what they call, the, <laughs> they call that, like that's a big deal for them and they have tournaments and they're talking smack and they, they go to meetings and then they go to eat pizza and drink Red Bull. I think it's called cornhole. Cornhole, okay. <laughs> I was like a bean bag, that's it's just, like, just this, like a hasty sack. Like, like, <laughs> they're just watching them like, hey, what do you got? Shh, Rufus, be quiet. I'm like, it's like you golf? Don't, don't like, it's like golf? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> You don't have a protractor or no, playing. I don't. What do you don't, do in your time? I don't. I watch Netflix series that have been suggested to me by these energetic youth. Oh, 
Oh, you can tell them I know a guy who was a cameraman for Ozark. There oh. you go, six degrees of separation. There you go, very good, very good. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, thank you again so much for, for coming in here. I really appreciate your time, and uh, as always, just being able to spend a little time with you is something I enjoy. So, I, again, I appreciate your willingness to come up uh, here to the studio and, and spend a little time with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. For all of you listening, I just I appreciate you tuning in and for your willingness to listen for understanding. That's what it's all about. So stay curious, ask more questions, and until next time, this is your host, Wendy Lawrence Ballard. Mm-hmm.